I love good news, amen. I'm addicted to the good news, addicted to the gospel of his grace because why it builds us up and brings us into what God has for us. Now, you'll notice Pastor Richie's not here this morning. He's been so blessed and favoured that he scored a trip to the Gold Coast as part of his, what he does during the week. And uh, so his office is being recognised, um, the Ray White office there. And there's a bit of a conference going on and it's all being showcased. And I think he's being showcased a bit as well from reading between the lines. So that's a real blessing. So um, you get to have me this morning. Amen. But same Holy Ghost, so we're all good. Amen. I was going to get someone to pray because I don't think we've got uh, music this morning. So, uh, Brother Tao, come up here. Come and uh, kick it off in prayer for us this morning, eh? Father, I thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's amazing, Father. We're together here. Amen. 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 <laughs> thanks, bro. I knew you had a good prayer in you. Awesome. And thanks to Warren and Uriah for doing all the setup this morning. And it's such a blessing. So we're going to continue on as we often do. Things tend to just roll here. So I want to continue actually on a scripture that Pastor Richie finished on last week. Anybody remember that particular one? Yeah? Anyone want to have a punt? 2 Peter 3, 18, and I did actually get my slides together. Had a little bit of difficulty, but um, did we uh, get there, Sam? You'd like to put up 2 Peter 3, 18. There we go. Nice. Okay. So uh, this is the scripture Pastor Richie finished on, talking about growing in grace. And uh, so I've taken it out of the Amplified for us. And so, but grow in grace, undeserved favor, spiritual strength, and recognition and knowledge and understanding of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. To him be glory, honour, majesty and splendour, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So be it. I love that. How, how many want to grow in God's favour? And uh, we all do, don't we? And, but notice there it also says recognition and knowledge. And uh, we want to just kind of expand on that this morning. Knowledge in itself doesn't sound like an exciting word, but I promise you by the end of this morning, you will be excited about it. Because this morning we're going to talk about revelation knowledge. In fact, if you bring up uh, our next slide, Sam, I think I just outlined the two types of knowledge. Um, anybody heard of E.W. Kenyon, the author? E.W. Kenyon, when we got married 30, 30 years ago, we bought every single one of his books. He's got quite a bunch of them. I still haven't read them to this day, but his titles are quite suggestive. And um, I need to stay in front of the camera here. One of the titles was called The Two Kinds of Knowledge. And what he was talking about is that there are two kinds of knowledge. The first one that we're most familiar with, it runs in our education systems, is what we call sense knowledge, natural knowledge. Nothing wrong with it. It's just a level of knowledge. And it comes through what? The five physical senses that we're all aware of mainly hearing and seeing and so forth. And that's one level of knowledge, right, which we're all familiar with. But there is a, a, a deeper level of knowledge, which is important to us as believers, and that's what we call revelation knowledge. Okay, everyone say revelation. Revelation knowledge, which comes through the five spiritual senses, all right? And that's kind of another message on its own, so I won't take a lot of time there. But just trust me for now that we also have five spiritual senses, all right? For example, hearing. Galatians, it says they had the, the hearing of faith. In other words, the, eye, the ears of the heart, if you like. The Bible talks about the eyes of the heart. Um, there, is a, there is touch in the spiritual realm, isn't there? You know, when the priest could no longer stand to minister because of the glory of the Lord, you can literally sense uh, the weight and goodness of his presence. There's also smell in the spirit. Uh, the fragrance, you know, Jesus is the rose of Sharon. There is a fragrance about him you can read in the Song of Solomon. And then taste, there's also spiritual taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So there are five spiritual senses, just like there are five physical senses. In fact, really, you know, when it comes down to it, our, 
our spirit man looks very much like our natural man. We still have a form. And in fact, Jesus appeared, didn't he, in a, in a spiritual body. And he could eat, he could taste, he had a spiritual form. And we also know in the story of uh, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, Lazarus the beggar, that when they both died, it says the angels carried Lazarus into Abraham's bosom. And it says the rich man died and was buried. And then the story goes on after they've died physically. Um, it goes on and there's a communication that happens between Lazarus or between the rich man and Abraham. And he talks about Lazarus coming and, and putting some water on the tip of his tongue. And so obviously, even though he's dead physically, the rich man still has his senses. He can still hear. He can still speak. He can still feel. And so you've got to understand how real the spiritual realm is. We still have, you know, God is a spirit, and he's real. Now, he has senses as well. He has a form. We've heard Pastor Richie talking about, you know, Moses and God, show me your glory. Well, God said, you cannot see my face, but you can see my back parts. See, there is form in, in the realm of the spirit. Spirit doesn't mean spooky. Spirit is real. Amen. Someone said, well, I just want steak on the plate. Well, before your steak was and your plate was, it was a thought in the mind of God. Yep. He created everything out of spirit, you see. So spirit is very pertinent to us as believers. That's where it starts. And revelation knowledge comes from God by the Holy Spirit to our spirit man. And that's what builds faith. That's what builds stability. And like Peter, that's, that's what makes us like a rock, makes us solid and stable. And if ever there's a day we need to be solid and stable and not moved, today's the day. Amen. 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 And so to be built on Christ, the chief cornerstone, is the very best place that we can have today. Amen? And so like I said, that's really another message all on its own. We could go into every scripture that deals with the five spiritual senses. But let's go to the next scripture. I just have a, a bit of a look at it. Uh, actually, I think I had, maybe I haven't got it, but I had the Psalm uh, 34 verse 8 where it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Isn't it interesting when we think about the manna from heaven, which is a type of the bread of life, a type of Christ, which fell daily. Anybody know what the manna tasted like? It actually, the, the Bible tells us what it was flavored like. Anybody have a guess? Honey, that's right. It says it's like wafers that taste like honey. And I think in Exodus, it actually talks about it tastes like olive oil, which speaks of the anointing. So a beautiful picture, isn't it, of, of tasting you know, the good word of God, tasting the Lord Jesus Christ. He tastes like honey in the rock and, and like oil, like anointing. Isn't that beautiful? In the Song of Solomon, it says he's like, he's described as having milk and honey under his tongue. So when he speaks, it's just that, that beautiful taste going forth. You know, he tastes like honey in the rock. You know, um, crave the pure spiritual milk of the word, etc. And so we can actually feed and desire the good word of God. So there we've got it there. Taste and see that the Lord, our God, is good. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man who trusts and take refuge in him. I think Psalm 125 says, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. That's solid. It says, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, the Lord surrounds his people. Amen. So I believe this is an important message. Um, on how to receive revelation knowledge from the Lord. You know, our desire is always to help people. And um, we've been very blessed to experience some things in God. And by God's grace today, I feel like I'm in a real stable place in the Lord. It's, it's like things that used to move me don't move me anymore. I just, we're just seeing God's blessings in our life, in our family, in, in our businesses. Um, we've heard the word rest and acceleration this year. Um, it's just been unreal in the last two months of business, this financial year, April, May. Um, I've done 40% profit of last year's complete total without trying, without doing anything different. It's glory to God. It's rest and acceleration. And see, the more things are revealed to us, the more we can actually rest. And it's just interesting. You know, I've been a Christian probably, we've been Christians probably around 40 years. And, you know, you do a lot of observing, don't you? If you're like me, you just, you just look and you learn 
And one thing I've seen, which in some ways is a bit of a mystery, some ways it's not, is that you can see two people hearing the same message. One of them can be just like blessed, favoured, protected, seems like they don't go through any struggles, and the other one just lives on Struggle Street. Have you ever noticed that? Maybe you've been through that. I've been through that myself. I've been through Struggle Street as well. And it's like I've seen favour on people's lives, and I'm thinking, what, how come? I'm trying so hard, and it looks like they're not even trying, and they've got favour. You know, and everyone, anyone relate to what I'm saying? And I've just observed this sort of thing in my own life and other people's lives, and it's like it, it just seems to boil down to a very simple truth, and that is one has revelation knowledge and one doesn't. One heard and one is hearing. You say, well, I, I heard that message too. Yeah, but are you hearing it? Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. See, yesterday's manna was good yesterday. It gave you strength for yesterday. But if you didn't get it fresh again this morning, you can't live on yesterday's strength. You see, hearing and hearing. And it's not a chore because you develop an appetite for the things of God. It's tasty. You taste like honey and milk. Very, very tasty. You know, in the natural, you can develop taste for things which maybe you didn't have a taste for. I've even heard crazy people say that they get a taste for salad. Yeah, you know, can you believe that? <laughs> so they go off junk food and they just eat salad and they love it. It tastes so good. It takes a lot of faith to believe that, but if it works for you, that's great. <laughs> I'm happy for you. <laughs> so now we're going to spend a little bit of time uh, looking at Peter today, as we already have. Because we know in Matthew 16, and we'll look at that later, that Peter was the one that had that great revelation uh, from the Lord. And it's interesting that that revelation actually made him very bold. And in some ways, it placed him on a level playing field with Jesus. And he actually began to rebuke Jesus. But you know, the Lord said to me this week when I was walking, he said, did you notice that it's a spirit of wisdom and revelation? And I said, well, apparently not, Lord, because you wouldn't have asked me. But there it is. He's, he's given us not just a spirit of revelation, but a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Very important. Peter got a revelation, but he didn't necessarily get the wisdom right then to go with it. And he started rebuking the one who had given him the revelation. Okay, so it's a little bit like this is something for us to mature in. It's like if I stood up here and taught on divine health and healing. You know, it's God's will to be healed, and I proved it by the scripture. And then somebody jumps up and starts running out the door and say, hey, where are you going? Well, I'm, I'm off to the hospital to pray for all the sick. You said God wants to heal all. Well, see, they, they went off half-cocked, right? They got a revelation, but it's the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Amen? You've got to mature. You've got to keep receiving it and let, let the spirit of wisdom come with that revelation. Then you'll know how to walk it out, not run off half-cocked. Amen? And if we did run off, it's okay. There's no condemnation. God will meet us where we're at. Right, let's go over to um, 1 Peter 2. Thanks, Sam. So this, is, uh, so this is the same Peter. So we could expect Peter and his epistles to refer to this event and to Revelation. So 1 Peter 2, 1 to 10. It says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Anybody tasted that the Lord is good? Anybody tasted his favor this last week? And you've probably, probably the reason you're here today is because you have a taste for his grace. And you, wanna, and you have tasted that the Lord is gracious and you want some more. Now, verse 4 says, Coming to him as to a living stone. Let's just camp there for a second. You know, some people say, well, how, how do you come to God? You know, the Bible says, come to God, draw near to God. How do you do that? Well, we already read it. You actually begin to receive the milk of his word because God and his word are one. And as you're receiving the milk, you're receiving him. You're receiving his thoughts, his nature, his righteousness, his, all, his grace is all in that. That's, you come to God by faith in his word, you see. So coming to him as a living stone, the cornerstone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Next verse, Sam. You also, as living stones. Now let's just camp there for a second. Remember Peter? 
what happened when he got the revelation. What did Jesus say? He says, you are a stone, a living stone, and on this rock I will build my church. So revelation to our hearts causes us to become a living stone, right? So you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And thank God he does make our praises acceptable. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. He who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Anybody testify to that? He never lets us down. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient or who don't believe, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Then the next one says, They stumble being disobedient to the word, in other words, they didn't believe it, to which they were also appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're special. <laughs> Not peculiar, special. That you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? So we are built on the cornerstone of the Lord Jesus. We are being fitted together as living stones, built into a holy temple unto the Lord. And thank God he, he does the fitting. I'm glad I don't have that job or anybody else. God fits us together, and he likes to put those together that don't necessarily look like they fit in the natural, amen? He's just got a way of doing things. But it's revelation that actually brings us into unity. We're here, but we're here in this grace church because the revelation of grace has brought us together, amen? A spirit of unity, the unity of the spirit. Built together, let us not underestimate the potential of when we come together as, as a living body for God's spirit to move mightily. Amen? Thank you for your enthusiasm. <laughs> let's go to Ephesians 2. Let's just um, have a visit that thought again. Ephesians 2. Paul's obviously the other one that was very familiar with Revelation. Uh, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now, some have only preached half of that verse and made themselves uh, foundation stones, you know, apostles and prophets, but actually it reads on, it says, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, not the apostles and the prophets. They lay the cornerstone through the preaching of Jesus Christ, very important, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. That's that same thought. You know, God is strategic. I believe here at Grace Global and those who are listening online, God is building something. He's building us together as a dwelling place, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Some people call it like a corporate anointing. There is a, a stronger anointing when we come together under the revelation of Jesus, for his anointing to flow and uh, healings and wonders and signs and miracles. Amen. Praise God. I've got a couple of excited people. We can work with that this morning. That's fine. That makes three of us. <laughs> Glory to God. Okay. Now let's go to um, 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's just continue on this thought of, of revelation knowledge and why it's so important. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have, does everyone say have, obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. You notice that verse? You know, it's, you've, you've heard that verse many times across this pulpit. Grace and peace be not added, but multiplied to you in the knowledge. Again, we're not talking about knowledge that comes through the five physical senses. We're talking about revelation knowledge. See, if you want to get more grace and peace, just receive revelation. 
from the faith. Turn on your spiritual ears. Amen? Like the Galatians, the, the hearing of faith. You know, you can be hearing all of these things, but you open up the ears of your heart to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And that's what brings faith into our lives. Amen? You know, I know it's easy sometimes to get sidetracked and think about what's happening for lunch and uh, this afternoon, but you know, you want to open up those ears and, um, and actually turn the, turn the switch of faith on and be listening with an expectation that something good is going to happen to me today. I'm going to get a word today that's going to change my life forever. One word can change your life. One word can change your circumstances this coming week. Amen? Praise God. So I think there might be a verse or two more on the end of that, Sam. As his divine power has given to us, notice again the past tense, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge, revelation knowledge of him. You starting to get the picture? Who called us by glory and virtue. Now, this is where I say there's two, there's two groups of believer. There's those that know and understand that Jesus has finished the work, that he has provided all for us. We already possess it in our spirit. But then there's those that don't understand that, don't have a revelation of it, and they keep asking God for stuff that he's already given us. Okay? That ends up quite frustrating. Um, sometimes you can even end up bitter at God because you're working and you're asking, and yet it's not happening. God, where, where is it? It's not working for me, all right? But in fact, God's already done it. Jesus does not need to go back to the cross. Yeah. He says, it is finished. Yeah. It is yours. Yeah. You have an inheritance, you see. Now, how do we unlock that inheritance? Through revelation knowledge. We're going to see that with uh, Jesus and Peter when he starts talking about the keys of the kingdom, the keys that open doors to the places that God has for us to go. Okay, so we start on the basis of what Jesus has finished. He's given all to us. It's all for us to receive. That's why I love sitting under the word of God, sitting under teaching, because there is an anointing that flows, the Bible says, that opens my eyes to see just what Jesus has done for me. You know, I don't know about you, but I think I do. I think every one of us sitting here today wants God's best. And I'm not there yet, and I, I reckon you're not there yet either. And so we're going to keep preaching God's best. We're going to keep preaching his goodness. And because it's better to preach his best and get half of it than preach nothing and get all of it. Amen? I want God's best in my life. I mean, I'm so thankful. Man, we're seeing some stuff, seeing some stuff right now. Like I said, we're just so blessed. You know, we, we're booked on a holiday to Italy in August to go and see our daughter for three weeks. It's already all paid for. You know, God has just been so good to us. We went mortgage-free, you know, not too long ago. And the blessings of the Lord have just been flowing in our life because we're doing less and he's doing more. Amen. <laughs> Amen. It's, it's a rest. You see, it's, it is finished. He has done it. You see, and you just keep growing. It's just through sitting under the good news. Every time we sit under the good news, we come here, it just reinforces those truths on the inside. You just get a little bit stronger, a little bit more stable, a little bit more persuaded, a little bit more secure. And then something crops up during the week and it doesn't move you like it used to think, gee, that's growth. Praise God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in that church. Good things are happening to me. You know, I'll tell you what, you know, we, we hit a wall before we actually came to Grace Global. We, we had been well taught and we, we'd flowed in the blessings of God, but somehow what we had learned became law. And somehow that, that spirit of grace was not operating any longer because we were just operating in principles and formula and not in the person, you see. So we'd actually hit a wall. And when we came to Grace Global, we started hearing about the grace of God. And I'll tell you what, it was actually quite hard on the flesh. If I was just honest about it, I said, you're just making it too easy. You know, we, we, we've been doing this and doing that, and you need to do this and you need to do that. And you're just saying it's so easy. And I, my, my mind would just fight and fight and fight. But I just, after months, weeks and months and even years, that, that I just decided to give up, stop fighting. I thought, man, this sounds good. And not only that, I looked around at the ones who were receiving it, and I could see the fruit in their lives, and people like Warren and Pastor Richie and Moy and different ones, and I thought, man, these guys are actually enjoying the goodness of God. They're not striving. They're rested. I think there, there must be something in this. And I was just I was thinking, I'm, I'm just so glad I stayed and just eventually got the revelation. And now I couldn't be happier. I'm like, man, I just feel so rested, so thankful. You know, just enjoy life so much more. 
It's like things just work out and you don't know how and you just give the glory to God, amen? Because he's so good. And it's, you know, the thing about revelation is that we, we could not know God unless he revealed himself. You can't study God out. You can't find God through just through plain study. No, God reveals himself because he's a father. It says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. The devil can't steal revelation from you. Once it's in there, it's in there. Okay? We know he comes immediately to steal the word, but if you can get past that particular phase and, and receive the word with understanding and keep watering that word, that, that is going to take root and bear fruit in your life. And there's not a thing the devil can do about it. You are going to bear 30, 60, and 100 fold Amen. in your life. Amen. Praise God. So we rely on revelation. And the truth is God is more willing to reveal himself than we are to receive it. That's just who he is. He is a good father. Let's continue with Peter now. Second Peter 1.18. And he's actually going to refer to the uh, Mount Transfiguration, which also we hear a bit about. So verse 18, we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now, he's referring to the chapter in Matthew 17, which was right after Matthew 16, when he had the revelation, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. But it's interesting that this time he didn't hear the voice um, by revelation through his spirit. He actually heard an audible voice. Now, sometimes God will do that in his mercy because he can't get through to us here. And he'll actually speak to us out loud, but that's not his best. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, that is what it means to get revelation. It's sometimes people say, well, it just dawned on me or the light turned on, or I, suddenly I saw it. Like a flash, it just came up out of my spirit, and I suddenly had understanding. That's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about revelation knowledge. You know, it's really important, especially for this next generation, to understand that, because we live in such a world of information today. You know? And there's so much information, and I know this within, even within my own family, that people don't want to hear the same bit of information twice. It's like if you repeat something, they say, oh, I heard that. There's just so much information out there at the fingertips. It's like people don't want to even want to hear a bit of information twice anymore because you're taking up time like I'd be learning something new. But see, when we talk about revelation knowledge, we can't treat it the same way. It's not about getting more information from the Bible. You're better to have one revelation and live on that than go to Bible school for seven years and get a whole bunch of information and end up confused, not knowing God. That's the truth. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you just had that one revelation, that, that could take you so far. Amen? And so it's different. We, how do we get revelation established? By meditation. Meditation. That means slow down a bit. Chew on the cud. Chew over that word. You know, the Lord is good. And his mercy endures forever. You know, you just got a bill from the IRB. The Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting. Oh, my goodness, it's $10,000. The Lord is good, and his mercy is everlasting. What are you doing? You're meditating on the word of God. You're putting God first. He's good. It did, he saw that bill coming, but he's still good, and he's going to be good to you, and he's going to make a way. Amen? You know, it's interesting. You'd know this, Brother Warren, in the Hebrew. Um, the word for meditate is the word hagah, H, the three consonants, the H, hey, gimel, hey. Okay, we know hey, grace. Now, gimel, the pictogram for gimel in the Hebrew is a camel. So grace, transport, grace. So guess what? As you're meditating on the word of God, grace transported to grace. You're going from grace to grace. So as you're meditating, you know, the Lord is good. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing. Oh, Father, thank you. I am the righteousness of God and Christ. You're going from grace to grace to grace. What's happening? The favor of God is being multiplied in your life. And you're just enjoying. You're just tasting and seeing. You're enjoying every single mouthful. Oh, God, you're so good. 
He said, I love you so much. You're so good to me. He just tastes things, and it tastes like honey and milk. You're just having a feast at the table. And, and he's just pouring favor. He's anointing your head with oil. Goodness and mercy is following you all the days of your life. You know what a blessed place to live, isn't it? But revelation knowledge. See, we live in a fast-paced world today. We really don't want to stop and meditate, do we? But the, the benefits of meditation are, are so rich, so rich to keep hearing and hearing. Someone say, oh, you're just, you're just old-fashioned, you know. That's, how old's that book that you're reading? No, it's the bread of life. The manna is fresh. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday. He's more up-to-date than tomorrow's newspaper. Amen? The Bible has everything in it. You know, the book of Revelation, it's all there, isn't it? And we know how it ends. We're on the winning side. Glory to God. So, the light shines in a dark place. Let me just tap something onto there in the parable of the sower. Is this all right if I just flow around like this? It'll have to be anyway. <laughs> but in the parable of the sower, now right after that, there's a very interesting parable which you could sometimes just treat as a separate subject. But Jesus goes on to say, he says, nobody lights a lamp and hides it under a bushel or hides it under the bed. But he puts the lamp on a lampstand so that it gives light to all who are in the house. In other words, the light continues to burn. And he's, he's actually connecting that to the parable of the sower. So like I said, some heard, some are hearing. Now some heard, some go home today and they heard the word. All right? But what do they do with the lamp? Put it under the bed. Put the notebook away in the drawer. But those who continue to hear, what do they do? They take the lamp and they put it on a lampstand. They maybe write down a thought that they're going to meditate on. And what do they do? They allow that light to continue to shine through the week. And it gives light to the whole house. You are the house of God. Amen. His, his lamp enlightens your darkness. It lights up your soul. In his light, we see light. You see, that's the difference between two types of Christians. There's ones that, yeah, I heard a good message. But then there's one that says, yeah, the Lord spoke to me just on one point. Something just went off in my spirit. And I made a note of that, whether mentally or made a physical note. Put it on the fridge and let that lamp continue to burn. And as you meditate on that thought, it might have just be a little thought, just a little catch in your spirit. Hmm, sounds interesting. That grows into something. That's literally the, the righteousness of God growing on the inside of you. And before you know it, you become bolder and you become stronger. Amen. But don't start rebuking Jesus. Now, are we still on that? Here we are. We'll get through this verse, I promise you. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Well, I guess Peter learned that the hard way, didn't he? He interpreted what Jesus was saying the wrong way about Jesus' passion. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Word of God came by the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God is revealed by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Anyone ever been to a Bible study where there was no Holy Spirit? It was like, let's have a discussion around the Scripture and see what we can come up with. And the whole bunch ends up more confused than when you started because what our reasoning faculties kick into gear and maybe it could mean this. No, I think it means this. And then, then you kind of throw it all in the pot and come up with some kind of conclusion. Well, that's not revelation knowledge. That's just man's intellect trying to work out spiritual things. No, the Holy Ghost inspired the Word of God, the same Holy Spirit will enlighten the Word of God on the inside of you. And you'll know it because your heart will start to burn. You know it because it'll start happening down here on the inside and it'll work its way up into your understanding. Amen? You're going to hear a lot of things that you're not going to understand up here. That's why I'm saying you've got to hear with the ears of the heart. Amen? And meditate and let the Holy Spirit bear witness with your spirit that these things are true. Now, if you get a check in your spirit, then either put it on the shelf or throw it out. If you get something in your spirit that says, mm, that doesn't sound right, and, and it doesn't line up with the word of God, then you're at liberty to throw that away or put it on a shelf for later understanding. Amen. We have an anointing on the inside, 1 John 2, 20 and 27, and we know all things. We have the teacher, uh, the real teachers on the inside of us to bear witness with our spirits, the truth. And any time you come into freedom, then that's the spirit of truth. 
any word that brings you into bondage, that ain't the spirit of truth. Now, interestingly, um, I remember a time when my wife went to a, a conference, uh, probably about five, six years back now, uh, a very, an overseas speaker, um, a church not far from here, actually, and uh, a speaker came with great uh, accolades, um, international speaker, and so forth, and Christine went to the afternoon session, and she came back home, and she was a bit troubled because when she got in the car, immediately she got in the car from the last session, she had this massive headache, like this huge migraine headache just came on her. And it was like, you came home almost tormented. And I was just lying on the bed having a rest. And my wife comes home and she's like, she's tormented. And I just knew straight away this was something spiritual. So we addressed it and it left. But I said to Christine, I said, let's, um, this person was preaching that night. Let's go on the live stream and have a bit of a listen. And anyway, it started off okay, but as it got into it, it started to get a little bit off. And uh, this person started saying things like, um, you know, everything is inside of God, even hell. Everything, cause, because, and she tried to prove it by the scripture that all things, all things are in him, therefore hell must be in him, therefore there is a second chance for those who are in hell because they're in him. And I thought, my goodness, and something on the inside of me, just like you guys sit in there like, <clears throat> something's not right here. And I began to understand this. There's a, there's a wrong spirit has got in there somewhere. It's twisting and perverting the gospel of grace, you see. So I, actually, I knew the pastor. I rang him up because she was scheduled to speak the next day. And, you know, he was so thankful because he'd been feeling the same way. But, you know, he's like, man, this is an international speaker with accolades well known. And who am I to say, you know, um, I don't want you speaking in my pulpit. So he was very thankful that somebody else actually spoke with him about it, he really thanked me, and he said, I'm just going to get her to uh, do a few testimonies, and that'll be it. He didn't let her teach again in, in the church. But see, you know, you, you have an anointing on the inside of you. It's got to line up with the Word of God. Nobody has a corner on Revelation. Revelation has to be tested in the, the broad body of Christ. Amen. Nobody has a corner. Well, I've got this. If someone says, man, I've got this, I've got this special revelation from God, then, then your antenna should go up real quick. <laughs> And think, yeah, well, I, I better see that very plainly in the Word of God, okay? So we, are, we know that there are uh, false teachers and prophets around. Uh, most of them are offended. That's how it starts, and that's actually a biblical truth. It says uh, many are offended and many false prophets and teachers will arise. All right, another subject. Okay, did we get to the end of this one? Yes, we did. How long have you got? Okay, we're having fun here. Ephesians chapter 1. I love this one, Ephesians chapter 1. And um, Pastor Richie loves the scripture in verse 3, so do I. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, having predestined us to adoption of sons through Jesus Christ to himself, plays of his glory, and so on it goes. And just all the things that he's done, we are redeemed. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, and he just lays it on thick. Now, interestingly, after he's done that and he says we have an inheritance, he, he, he changes tack a little bit. And he said, because of all this truth that Christ has done for you, I'm praying for you guys. Okay. Now, what does he pray for? For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Remembering you in my prayers, I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that gives you a deep and personal and intimate insight into the true knowledge of him, for we know the Father through the Son. So in other words, this is Paul's take. He's saying, this, this is what Jesus has done for you. I know it sounds too good to be true. I know you can't take it all in. That's why I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the intimate knowledge of him. And it's like a, it's like a fatherly prayer. I pray that for my family every day. Here's an apostle praying for his church. Amen. And it's like the Lord said to me, you know, the believers don't even need to pray that. It's a fatherly prayer. It's going to be prayed for them. Isn't that awesome? 
He's just the father of supply, isn't he? He says, you can, you can just allow the leadership to pray that prayer for you, and you just enjoy the benefits. You be enlightened. Amen. Notice he didn't pray for a spirit of wisdom and determination. Someone said, well, in light of all these things, I'm just going to try hard. I'm just going to get more determined. I'm going to double up. I'm going to get more committed. No, that's not the order. The order is he reveals something to you, and that fuels your determination. Amen. That fuels your commitment. That fuels your obedience. It comes, it comes, we live internally, don't we? Intrinsically, intuitively. God does something on the inside and it moves us to do something on the outside, not the other way around. The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. There's a couple more verses there, Sam. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, there we go, five spiritual senses, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people. You know, we believe in preaching God best here, amen? Because as we do, he'll just keep building us up to that mark to receive all. I don't apologize for preaching God best. It might seem like pie in the sky to some, but if we aim for God's best and get half of it, that's better than aim for nothing and getting all of it. Amen? We want his best, don't we? Because Jesus died for us. He, he died a very, a very hard death so that we could have everything that belongs to us. Confident expectation. I love that. Know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee to which he has called us, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit. Now, he'll show us things. Now, the spirit of wisdom and revelation is not limited, let me say this carefully, it's not limited to everything you can find in the Word of God. It's, it's very practical as well. I find as a mechanic, that same spirit is very helpful in business. You'd know this too, Brother Warren. You know, he'll show us things to come. He'll, he'll just nudge us to do or not do something, and it doesn't make sense at the time, but then you think, well, I'm glad I listened. It could have, have saved me from an accident. I've had that a number of times in the workshop. I said, no, just put an extra clamp on here. Make sure it's secure before you lift that thing up, you know. And, and he's always proven to be right. He wants to save us from accidents and, and things like that. Um, sometimes, you know, buying a mower, as I do almost every day, I'll see one that looks really good, and yet some, somehow on the inside, I'm, I'm restrained. I'm like, God, look, look how good it is. It looks so good, you know. And, and something says, it's not good for you, son. And for whatever reason, it may not even be the, the product. It may just be he doesn't want me to have another mower at that time. He's already got enough. <laughs> Those are the ones you don't want to hear, right? <laughs> but see, that same spirit of wisdom revelation will, will help in a very, very practical way. It's just sometimes it's just so gentle, isn't it? You can... You can just dismiss it. It's like, oh, take it or leave it. But it always proves out to be wisdom. And if you followed it, you could have saved yourself a bunch of time. I, I have times where I overrode his voice and I bought mowers and they were shockers. Lost money on them. Drove a long way to get them. Disappointed all the way back home. And he said, don't go there. But I knew better, didn't I? See, he's there to help. He really is our helper. Amen. And thank God for his mercy. Thank God some of those dungas I bought, I still made a profit. <laughs> Praise God. Right. How are we tracking? Still got a few hours. Okay. Let's get into Matthew 16, 13, because this is really where, where it happens for us. I think Matthew 16, 13. We can see once again the two types of knowledge in operation. Okay. Sense knowledge, revelation knowledge. So here we go. Matthew 16, 13. Now, when Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And now we can see sense knowledge go straight into action, can't we? They answered, well, some say John the Baptist, which is interesting, isn't it? In other words, many people didn't receive John the Baptist because he had already come. Others, Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. See, that's what human reason will do for you, okay? But he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? Next verse, Sam. And I love this. Simon Peter replied, 
You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, how did he know that? I don't, I don't believe that he even necessarily premeditated that. I really think as Jesus asked the question, he just suddenly knew the answer. The spirit of wisdom and revelation just happened in his life. Whether it happened before or at the present doesn't really matter anyway. But he got a revelation. And Jesus answered him, blessed, happy, fortunate, and to be envied. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. Simon, which we know means reed, Simon bar Jonah, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood, men, senses, have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Okay. Now you cannot know anything unless God reveals it to you. That's, that's really the truth. But like I said, God wants to reveal things to you. But there is such a thing as timely revelation. Amen. There is such a thing as communion and relationship and strategic revelation in your life. All right? And uh, God is strategic and God is a builder. Line upon line, precept upon precept. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Next verse, Sam. And I tell you, you are Peter. All right? So you were Simon. You were a reed blown on the wind. What does that mean? Greek, Petros, a large piece of rock. Okay? And of course, the Catholics love this scripture. <laughs> First Pope, <laughs> a large piece of rock. So what, what's he saying there? Because of this revelation, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All of a sudden, you've just changed. Just like that, the speed of light, you've become a rock instead of a reed. And on this rock, which is the Greek word Petra, very similar word, a huge rock like Gibraltar, which is actually describing Jesus, the chief cornerstone, I will build my church. So back to those other scriptures, we saw the cornerstone and the living stones, right? So we see that again. Peter, a large piece of rock, a living stone. And on this rock, Petra, the cornerstone. I will build my church. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, us as living stones with the revelation built on him. And not only that, and the gates of hell, Hades, the powers of the infernal region, shall not overpower it or be strong to its detriment, or hold out against it. Amen. Thank God we're part of the victorious church. Amen. Someone, uh, I think it was Brother Kenneth E. Hagan, wrote a book called The Triumphant Church. And he said there's three types of church. There's the defeated church, there's the warring church, and there's the triumphant church. Well, I thank God I'm part of the triumphant church. Amen. Some are, some are part of the warring church. They're still fighting for that victory. But the good news, Jesus already defeated the devil for us. Amen. We're part of the triumphant church. Amen. And the gates of hell will not hold out against it. Now, people used to think that that was talking about the fact that the gates of hell were basically to protect the church and that, so that Satan couldn't get into the church. But it's actually not true. It's the other way around. These are the gates that Satan tries to protect himself with that will not prevail against the church because we're plundering hell to populate heaven. Amen. We're taking back our inheritance. We're taking souls for the kingdom of God. See, he doesn't, those gates do not have the power to hold you out as a blood-bought believer full of revelation knowledge about your authority in Christ. You can go on in and claim what belongs to you. Amen? Praise the Lord. You're part of the triumphant church. You already have the victory. You're not on your way to victory. You have the victory in Christ Jesus. Amen. You are a victorious, free, blood-bought, spirit-filled, faith-walking, Bible-talking believer, child of the Most High God, living in faith and victory, overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony, eating the good of the land, because that's what he died for you and I to have. Amen? So the gates of hell will not hold out against it. You know, that's why Satan is so scared of you getting revelation. That's why he comes immediately to steal that word, because he knows that's the seed of your victory. That's the seed of your fruitfulness. That's why he comes. The Bible says immediately, just like he came to Peter, the moment he received that revelation, Satan came right there, didn't he, to tempt him, and he ended up rebuking Jesus. Anyway, we're going to see a bit more of that later on. Okay, next verse, Sam. I love this. So, you know, you've got you to picture this. Peter is starting to feel pretty good about himself right now. He's been singled out now amongst the twelve. And Jesus is speaking directly to him. 
and continuing to speak to Peter. And we know Peter was quite ambitious, you know, in his kind of human self. And so now Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You know, you can just imagine Peter thinking, man, that's pretty good. <laughs> hey, guys, did you hear that? <laughs> I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind, and again, the Catholics love this scripture, declare to be improper and unlawful on earth must be what is already bound in heaven. Whatever you loose and declare lawful on earth must be what is already loosed in heaven. That was a scripture that I really didn't understand for a long time until I saw it in the Amplified Bible, and then it just became very clear to me. Now, so what are the key? Why, why is he mentioning keys in conjunction with revelation? Because when you get a revelation, it gives you the key. When you get a revelation that Jesus not only died on the cross for your sins, but for your, he bore your sicknesses and pains, guess what? He just put a key in your hand. He said, go and unlock your healing. I've given you access to your healing right now, you see. See, what happened? That revelation went off, and all of a sudden, you saw that healing was available in heaven. It had already been released in heaven for you, and now you have the key. What's the key? It's your mouth. You have it in your heart. Now you declare it, say, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed and made whole. Thank you, Father. You did it for me. Amen. Isn't that awesome? I remember again, uh, Kenneth Hagin, I think he had like a, a, a small stroke, and uh, one side of his face uh, got completely paralyzed. He, he could talk, but only one half of his lips were moving. The other half couldn't. And uh, he, he, he's just thank God for his healing. He was a man of faith. And uh, the devil came to him and said, uh, oh, he was laughing. He was, he was just laughing and he was enjoying the victory. He said, I got the victory, even though half his face is paralyzed. And the enemy comes to him and said, what are you laughing at? And he said, I'm, I'm laughing at you. And, and the devil said, well, you're not going to get your healing. He said, that's why I'm laughing. I don't have to get it. Jesus got it for me. Amen. <laughs> Jesus already got it. Jesus did the work. So the keys of the kingdom. Now notice there the word declare is used. See, how did you get born again? Just by believing in your heart? Faith came, didn't it? The gospel of grace was preached. Faith comes by hearing. You believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead. But what else did you do? You confessed with the mouth that Jesus is Lord. Amen. You said it so God could hear it. You said it so you could hear it. And you said it so hell could hear it. Because you now just changed your allegiance. Amen. You declared Jesus Christ is now my Lord. He's in my heart. Amen. And so the declaration, we have the same spirit of faith. We believe, therefore we speak. You see? So it's not complete until it's spoken. Faith ain't faith until it's spoken. Amen. Amen. Yep. The keys. See, here's the key right here. It's about a couple of centimeters below the nose. But the key is, the, the thing is here, find out what is, it's got to be revealed to your spirit. What belongs to me? See, sometimes where we miss it is we hear a testimony about somebody got a breakthrough, and then we think, praise God, they got a breakthrough, I'm going to go for that too. But the, the only thing is we don't have the revelation of it. It hasn't yet been revealed, and so it didn't work. We get frustrated, and we think, hey, does God love that person more than he loves me? Have a little pity party? Poor old me? I guess I'm just no good. I guess I'll just have to settle for second bit. No, revelation gives you the key. Amen. God is no respecter of person. We're all his favorites. We're all loved equally by him. Now, I remember hearing a story years ago. This is a good old story. Whether it's true or not doesn't really matter. But I heard this story about a guy, an old guy, and his, on his bucket list, he only really had one thing on the bucket list, was to go on a cruise. You might have heard this story. And so he saved, and he saved, didn't have a lot of money, saved. And eventually he bought himself a ticket to go on that cruise. So he got himself on the cruise, and he thought, well, I'll, um, I'll pack some, some stuff that I can have in my cabin, you know, for, for the meal times, a couple of weeks cruise and so forth. So he got on the cruise, enjoyed the cruise, and, you know, when it was meal time and people would go to the dining hall, he'd just go to his cabin and have himself a snack and get by that way. Anyway, as the cruise was over and they're all disembarking, going down the gangway, he, he turns to somebody and uh, says, oh, that was a great, great cruise, wasn't it? I say, yeah, sure was. He said, but I, I didn't notice you around, didn't notice you in the dining hall. The guy said, oh, well, I, you know, I just bought the cheap ticket, and uh, so I, I bought some food, and whenever you guys went to the dining hall, I just went to my room and had some cheese and crackers, and the guy had a, just almost his jaw dropped, and he said, he said, didn't you know? 
that the food was included in the ticket. I think I was like, oh my goodness. I could have been in the dining hall having the best food with all the rest of them. See, it belonged to him, but he hadn't, didn't have the knowledge of it. Wasn't able to enjoy the benefits of it. And that describes, some, sadly, some people in the church today. They don't have the revelation of what Jesus has done for them. He's still asking God for the things that he's already freely given. But they don't have the revelation knowledge in the heart to receive. Not because God, God didn't want to give it, but sometimes we just need to receive. Amen? You know, Mary and Martha, we often refer to them, don't we? They, they typify those two types of people. Mary was quick to sit and listen, and she was blessed, wasn't she? She received something. Martha was like, she was thinking about the natural, you know, the, the natural food. That was more important to her. But that wasn't what Jesus was about that day. Jesus came to feed their spirits and to feed their troubled souls. And Mary chose the good part. What about you? Amen? Going to choose the good part? Do we have any more on that one, Sam? I think that might be it. Okay, let's go. We're coming in for a landing very shortly. Okay, let's, um, let's have communion. If you'd like to pass the communion out, we're going to go to Luke 24. How are we doing, all right? Anyone still awake? Luke 24. Okay, I love this one. Here's another classic example of the two types of knowledge, right? Very understandable, by the way. So the, t the road to Emmaus. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned. Amen. That's that Bible study, isn't it? When you get together and converse and reason. That Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. Okay, revelation knowledge. Now we've just skipped out a whole bunch there, just for the sake of time. Now then they drew near to the village where they were going. And he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Next verse, Sam. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. Taste and see. They tasted of the Lord's Supper, and their eyes were open. See, we can take that literally. Taste and see. As you feed on his word, whether it's in the mornings or whenever it is, like driving in the car, you begin to taste the milk and the honey. Guess what? You begin to get sight. Remember Jonathan? When his father made a rash oath about to the army and said, you shall not eat until evening. Jonathan found some wild honey put out a stick and drew some of that wild honey, put it in his mouth. It says his eyes were brightened. Honey's a type of revelation. See, Saul was cursing his army. Jonathan didn't hear the oath, and he took of the revelation, put it in his mouth. It says his eyes were brightened. And he says, why has my father troubled Israel? If we had partaken of the honey, we would have had a much greater victory. See, taste and see that the Lord is good. You are salt and light. You are tasty. Taste and see. People can taste and see Jesus through your life. They taste that you are seasoned with grace. And the light and the presence that you carry in the Lord gives them light to see. Amen? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. All right, let's take our communion together. Praise God. Jesus drew near to reveal himself. He does that. He loves to do that, doesn't he? He loves to break bread with us. The bread of life. Fresh manna from heaven. I trust you've been fed this morning. This is, this is Jesus, the bread of life, broken for us to feed us, build us up, and give us an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. So let's taste and see the Lord is good. Amen.
and we thank him for this amazing new and better covenant based on better promises where we have a better high priest, better everything through his blood, a blood, uh, a covenant that is unshakable, unbreakable because it's between the Father and the Son and belongs to us in Christ. So let's taste and see that he is good. Amen. Just if you could bring up the last slide for us, Sam. I don't know how you like to receive the, the blessing, whether you like to close your eyes or lift your hands or just receive, but the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom peace. You are blessed. You're going to have a great week. You have the victory in Christ. Amen. And you have a great week. We'll see you next time. Amen.